Welcome to Wagon Wheel with me, Jared Kimber. Apologies uh, for me being late. Uh, apparently, I don't even know when my own uh, show starts. Um, although that's that's completely within character. Here's a fun story or stories. I would say that somewhere in the amount of 50 to 100 to maybe 150 times in my life, I've got on the wrong train or forgotten to get off a train or the wrong public transport altogether. Uh, put my head down, started to do some writing, and then suddenly woken up in a place I've never seen before. And I'd love to say that I've matured beyond that, uh, but one happened a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, I'm here. I'm going to talk cricket. Play the bumper. Uh, thank you to everyone coming across. I did a live uh, with Sora recently, and he spent the whole time saying, please like um uh on on uh, on this because it helps people find it and the algorithm i don't know what that means really um but he seems to know a lot more about uh youtube and uh getting getting people onto lives than i do so if you can do any of that it would be uh very interesting um uh, to see if it works <laughs> to see if it works at all uh, just a couple of things i see there's already a couple of questions coming up and we've also got the uh Oh, which I forgot to download the uh, the the questions that came in on um, uh, what's that thing called Twitter. Uh, uh, but just be, before we get there, I just want to talk about a couple of things which I haven't made videos on, uh, and I still may make videos on. But uh, just on the women um, not being paid in uh, cricket by the BCCI for for the, what happened the uh, Indian women's team. It's really important to know how badly run and uh, cricket is at the moment. I wrote a piece for The Guardian about how the players union are basically having to sue for their own uh, image rights, uh, sue the ICC directly. Uh, I've written two different pieces on how coaches never get paid and how players quite often don't get paid. Uh, all of those pieces I would say have been written within the last year and it's not particularly a new thing. Uh, and it's ab abhorrent, it's ridiculous. We, it, this is our money. Right, you watching these games is why the ICC get to sell their rights for so much money. Uh, you being an Indian supporter or a T20 supporter or whatever league it is, is the reason that these leagues make their money. And then the money that these leagues make is not given to the players, the coaches, sometimes weird people like t-shirt manufacturers and all sorts of things. And it is completely unacceptable. It happens far too much in cricket. Late payments in T20 cricket uh, an absolute disgrace and happen all the time. But this is not just uh, about uh, late payments. This is about non-payments altogether. Um, I just, yeah, honestly, I don't think it's an acceptable situation uh, for cricket to be in. And and I suppose just on, on that, I just want to sort of segue a little bit into what happened with Ryan Burl. For those of you who don't know, Ryan Burl is a leg spinning all-rounder from Zimbabwe who uh, has good talent. Uh, I, I really like him. I think he's a late 20s cricketer. If he wasn't from Zimbabwe and played for another cricket country, I could see him playing in a lot more T20 leagues around the world. And he recently had to take to Twitter and say that he needed someone to help him because he can't glue his shoes together anymore, or sick and tired of gluing his shoes or uh, whatever, whatever the situation was. He needed cricket boots and he plays for Zimbabwe and he couldn't get them. Uh, now, the story has ended quite well as he's found a sponsor, Puma, uh, and Puma have helped him out. But it just shows how ridiculous the sort of situation uh, that is. So I just want to start with those two things uh, because they're both, uh, I think it tells us, you know, while, you know, we make videos on here about everything from, you know, a big bash all the way through to, you know, European cricket. There's a lot. Of, why did I start with big bash and not IPL? Uh, there's a lot of problems when it comes to, uh, you know, the way that cricket is run and things that are going on within the game specifically. Um, so, Despite uh, uh, despite me being late, there's a bunch of questions here already. So I'll take up a couple and then we'll move over to YouTube. Uh, sorry, to, to Twitter questions in a moment as well. Darby says, uh, why is Billy Stanley not successful despite having height and pace both? Now, I like this because I'm a big Billy Stanley nutcase. For those of you who don't know, Billy Stanley is... The best way of putting Billy Stanley is he's taller than Mornay Morkel and he's faster than Mornay Morkel. Now, most tall guys bowl absolute cream puffs, right? It's actually very hard to bowl very at that height and maintain the pace. Um, 
that said, there's a reason why there are so many medium pace and 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 uh, you know good medium fast, even fast medium um, tall guys, and that's because of the extra bounce that they get. But they do have trouble generating that pace, so that means that they should be absolutely you know blitzing when it comes to uh, this the um, the the combination of of those two things, right? Sorry, apparently all the lights are going out around me. <laughs> So that's what should be happening with Billy Stanley. Uh, the problem is, I've got I've got this theory about Billy Stanley specifically that we have reached a period where being just being fast is very handy, but a combination of being fast and accurate is probably what's going to make you your money these days. So I would say that Pat Cummins is the most accurate fast bowler we've ever had, and I mean someone who is legitimately fast but also accurate. So Dale Stain could be accurate and Alan Donald could be accurate. You know, um, I'm trying to think of some other, uh, Jason Gillespie, um, for instance. I don't think we've ever had a combination of someone as quick as Pat Cummins and as accurate as Pat Cummins at the same time. And I think what that means is that for someone like Billy Stanley, who doesn't have those um, attributes, I think that's a problem. But realistically, I would not be shocked at all if, you know, in the next two or three years, he works it out and, or just at one stage just has an incredible run where he does very, very well. He's a, such a good cricketer. That's a really good question. though. Aditya says, uh, for the Indian Tour of England and the World uh, Test Championship, will you play both Jadu and Ashwin? Will you be tempted to use fast bowling all-rounder like um, Shardul? I mean, Shardul is not a fast bowling all-rounder. Um, <laughs> it's funny how often people say that. I think he averages 17 in first-class cricket. Uh, he's played a couple of good innings. He can hit the ball. Uh, I'm trying to think of what's a good comp for his batting. Um, Stuart Broad? Before he got hit in the face, was probably actually probably better than him, wasn't it? Uh, you know, I, I I think he would struggle to do that role. I honestly think that they've got three great seamers options. You know, really good options with 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 the fastball, and they have two incredible spinners. So I think I would uh, I think I'd make it as simple as that. Um, pick your five best bowlers, um, give yourself extra batting through Ashwin and Jadeja, and um, take it from there. If I was India, um, but just so everyone knows. Uh, I will not be. Um, I will not be part of that. Uh, India has not asked me for my thoughts on their eleven. Sadly, um, I would very much love to do that. Uh, let me just go through some of the other. You've all turned up at once, haven't you? Um, let's have a look here. Indian test. Yeah. Is the BCCI going to destroy international cricket? I mean, international cricket is going to be destroyed by the fact that the, all the teams involved have not got together um, to come up with a, a, a genuine league. I think that is the, uh, that's where it comes down to. We, we could be in a situation, we should be in a situation where this uh, international cricket is a league and it makes money and it travels around the world properly and is run. It, you say, is the BCCI going to ru ruin it? Is T20 cricket going to ruin it? Is uh, is a Rebel League suddenly popping up? We weren't. I don't think people understand how close we were to having a Rebel League with having most of the biggest cricketers in the world sign a contract with a company that Lalit Modi was um, dealing with, uh, ZTV, I think, were on board, to having a Rebel League and having all the best cricketers in the world disappear. That was only, what, six years ago? Seven years? What year are we in? 2021? Um, maybe seven years ago? Eight years ago now? Uh, that's almost happened once. Uh, it could certainly, certainly happen again. So uh, it's, uh, you know, those sorts of things are very, very possible going forward. Um, uh, you know, no one runs world cricket. It's it's a bilateral agreement series. So it's completely vulnerable uh, to almost everything at the moment. Just making sure that's not my producer telling me I'm wrong. Um, uh, Jai says, who should bat? Who should India but play at six in England tests if an extra batter was needed? Uh, Rahul or Vihari or Sunder or Mayank. Uh, there's a lot of options there. Uh, at six. I think Vihari, probably of those names that you've just mentioned, makes the most sense. I don't think... I think we've, I think we've seen Washington Sundar play really, really well recently. I don't think that means we should automatically think he's going to be able to bat at six in England. There's a big difference between a couple of good performances in Australia, um, some good performances at home, and the ability to bat number six in England, where the Duke ball is probably still going to be swinging. 
where reverse swing becomes an option, all those sorts of things, where he's going to be going up against probably Broad and Anderson, two of the best bowlers against left hand is in the home conditions ever. Um, so, uh, but, but, but it's interesting to see um, how they think about that and where they eventually go with that kind of a lineup. Uh, I'll just pop over here and um, have a look at some of the questions on Twitter. Uh, so question number two, why is Shy Hope doing so bad in Test cricket? He scored two top-class hundreds against top-class bowling attacks, double top-class, I like it. But since then, he hasn't done anything in the red ball format. Yeah. I don't think there's an exact reason. Like if you're looking for, you know, something very specific, I don't think I'm going to be able to come up with that um, off the top of my head. What I would say is this, that, he is obviously a very good batter, but he, he he's coming from a system that is not very developed. And so you are going to see a lot of West young West Indian players, especially the batters, I think, come through with holes in their game. I mean, before he made those two top-class runs you're talking about, wasn't he averaging just a frightful average? And it's not that I don't think he's talented. I mean, even if you look at his brother, it's not that these guys aren't talented. It's that they're not coming through the same kind of first-class system that other major teams are. If you compare them to New Zealand or Sri Lankan batters, I just think they're going through a much better first-class system to be able to come through to be ready for test cricket. So someone like Shai Hope, and, and when you look at white ball cricket, you're taking away a lot of the oh, – what's the best way of putting it? You're taking away a lot of the – extra problems, the extra challenges that you need to have. White ball cricket is really, it's, if you're a good player like him, a good natural player like him, a lot of it is almost an equation at a certain point. And so what has Shai Hope worked out? He's worked out he can bat very long in white ball cricket without taking too many risks, having a slightly slower strike rate than everyone else, but being a very good anchor. If you're a batter of his natural talent, that's fine. That is not a role that you can play in test cricket. It doesn't exist. And so everything that you have to do in test cricket is then heightened. And I think that is part of the problem. I also think there are probably very basic things, and I'd have to do a proper analysis of Shy Hope to go through it. But my guess is that there are probably very basic holes in his technique that are easier to find when you are um, – are playing against him in a test match than you are in a white ball game. And that's, you know, we see that a lot. That doesn't mean he's not a talented player. It just means, uh, I remember uh, talking to someone very recently. Um, uh, now, what is her name? Uh, Dr. Sheree, I want to say Dr. Sheree Caldwell. I think that's her name. Um, she's a vision specialist in cricket. Well, in sport, actually. She works right across sport. And she's worked with a lot of cricketers. She came up through Bob Woolmer and... Um, one of the other, uh, T Tim Noakes um, and Bob Woolmer, you know, so incredible brains in sport. And she was saying to me that the thing that she learned really early on when she was working with an athlete was how good they are at hiding their flaws. And I think you, test cricket is one of those formats of the game where it's even harder again to hide your flaws. Whereas in T20 cricket and one day cricket, I think you have the ability to do that. So that would be my guess with Shy Hope without doing, you know, a ridiculous deep dive into uh, any technical issues. But I think it's just easier to hide things in T20 cricket. Uh, Shalini says, why are test openers currently so crap? Now, I have another one. A question eight on Twitter also says, do you think test openers in gen this generation get more criticism considering the fact it's been one of the hardest times for batters and regularly compared with openers and blah, 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 blah. Um, sorry, crazy. I'm not going to read the whole question. But it's really interesting because, you know, Shalini's question there has sort of led into um, John's question there. I don't think test openers are currently bad. I think that we have an incredible crop of bowlers around the world. I think that analysis is currently on a level that no, that I don't think the casual fans even understand how much analysis there is in going into um, the preparation for it. It is not that hard for me as an amateur when I want to look up this stuff to be able to find enough information to tell you exactly where you bowl five balls of an over to a particular batter to get them out regularly. That is a thing that now exists. And all the averages have gone down. It's not just openness. All the averages right across the board um, have, have had a big dip. We're starting to have um, a, a slight upsurge of recent time. I think it's a combination of bowlers are, uh, uh, go back to that Pat Cummins thing from before. I think bowlers are more accurate now. And I think they have to be because of T20 cricket. 
I think bowlers are, especially seam bowlers, are faster now. I think bowlers are better at getting the ball to move sideways than we've ever seen when it comes to flats pitches. So old bowlers were absolutely brilliant at uh, swinging the ball. But in the old days, once the ball started swinging, if there wasn't any seam movement naturally in the pitch, you would kind of stop. The wobble seam, for instance, um, completely changes things like that. The ability to uh, reverse swing the ball uh, far more than we ever have. Um, all those sorts of things, I think, are playing on, into it and, and are just creating a better version of bowling. So my thought is, and it's really interesting because we've seen this in baseball as well, that analysis basically helps bowlers more than batters. Now, there might be a complete change to that in, 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 in the future. But as we currently see it, I think that makes sense. So realistically... If that is what we are currently seeing, and it's probably a combination of a bunch of things, there's absolutely no doubt that a lot of CEOs around the world started making more bowler-friendly surfaces, um, seam and spin at times. And I think all those things are going in. So I don't think we've suddenly got like this terrible crop of openers. We might have an average crop of openers. But if you look at the numbers before 2017 when we had that dip, Dean Elgo was playing, having a really good career, right? Since... Uh, since that point, Dean Elgar has really, really struggled. Now, he's not the only opener I've noticed this with. Uh, David Warner is another one. I'm trying to think. There's a, there was a couple. I, I, I did a list not that long ago. And they all dipped off at the same point. My guess is that if that is the case, that it's not that the openers are any worse. It's that the bowling, the pitches, and the analysis has all got better at a similar time. Uh, the best way to look at this is left-handers. It wasn't that long ago that... Bowlers just didn't bowl around the wicket to left-handers that much, and certainly not with a new when they were first at the crease or with a new ball. Now, we've now realized it is the far superior way to bowl to left-handers as they are currently setting up. And so we've had this massive dip-off, and that is a huge part of it. Um, and I think that has certainly played a role in that. So I don't think openers are, uh, are crapper now than they were <laughs> a little while ago, but I also can understand why it might look like that. I think that's two questions in one. That's absolutely great. Uh, Path says, your thoughts on uh, postponing England-India tests for the IPL? I think we have to be realistic and say there is too much cricket. That's why this is happening. There is too much cricket because no one is in charge of cricket at the moment. And all these problems are always going to come back to the fact that no one is in charge. The ICC is not in charge. The BCCI is not even really in charge. You know, the ECB is not in charge. And you have, I, I said at the start of the pandemic, we have to cancel a whole bunch of cricket. And they haven't tried to cancel cricket. They're, we're still trying to fit everything in as much as possible. Very little cricket has been outright cancelled. And now we're trying to squeeze it in and squeeze it in and squeeze it in. We don't know how long this is going to go. We have to throttle back a little bit, but that's not how cricket boards think. And so in that particular case, it, it doesn't matter what the event is. We, you know, What if it wasn't the IPL and it was the World Cup? Exactly the same thing might have to happen. There is too much cricket. Now, obviously, the IPL is the most profitable thing in the world. From a political standpoint, you could certainly see why England would be like, okay, what can we get out of this situation to help us? And India is thinking, uh, you know, we can build an ally here going forward, perhaps, if we can help them out as well. It all makes sense. But, you know, realistically, uh, the things that pay the most are going to dictate what the calendar looks like. and. If, if anyone out there watching this thinks this is a new thing, go back and have a look at the entire history of cricket. The things that have paid the most always dominate, whether that is T20 cricket, whether that is a World Cup, whether that is test matches. The reason we stopped having tri-series test matches is because we couldn't make any money out of them. It's not because it wasn't a better idea. It's a really good idea to have one whole summer where, you know, three teams or four teams go out and play a bunch of tests. You could have simultaneous tests. You know, you could, you, you could have a whole summer in Australia where you have Australia, India, England, New Zealand, South Africa, whoever playing in this series. And you have two games going uh, going on, one in the Wacker and one at the Gabba. Um, we could do all sorts of things. We don't because it doesn't make us money. The IPL makes money. This test series is going to make money for England. So they're going to have to come up with a plan that helps both of those places make money because they both need each other, essentially, um, at a certain point. Because India also need England, even if it's less than. England need India. Um, and that's the problem with no one running the game. Uh, so that's my thoughts on it. I hope that helps. Uh, let's have a look. What else have we got on? Uh, uh, question four. Love your piece on Mustafiza. 
Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, have you ever thought uh, on classes of fans, super fan versus moderate fan in cricket? T20 cricket can grow to be like MMA, a very niche but loyal fan base, or like NFL, large fan base but very enthusiastic. Your thoughts? I actually wrote about this uh, quite a long time ago, and the, the way I noticed it first was actually through um, uh, India Pakistan. Uh, India Pakistan played a game. I did a huge amount of research. I basically I put up a Reddit post, put up a bunch of tweets, I contacted all my friends, and I wanted their kind of memories of India Pakistan because it it's a different kind of thing and that. It's not a normal cricket game in any sense of, of the word. And I really wanted to get to if people had like an autographical memory of these games. And they do in a way that doesn't happen on a normal sort of cricket way or a normal sports way as much. And the one thing I really learned is that it, that India-Pakistan game certainly brings out a lot of people who don't follow cricket. So... I, I've so in that piece, I, and I and I've written about it before or, or uh, since as well. Maybe done a podcast on it. You kind of have. I'm going to put Crick Info fans at the very top, right? and I don't necessarily just mean Crick Info fans, uh, but we're talking about people who really care about the stats of the game. They really care about cricket more so than just their particular team. They can tell you who the captain of Bangladesh is, even if they're not from Bangladesh and they're not particularly interested in it. Uh, they can remember a Kirtley Ambrose spell from, you know, so many years ago. And, and that's, that's kind of that top level of fan. And that that's the sort of people you see in the cricket Twitterati. You see them on cricket Reddit. Uh, you see them hanging around Rubalinda footage on, on, on YouTube here. Probably, probably you know, a, a good um, amount of... Um, uh, of you are in the comments here. I think, as a general rule, m my fans tend to come from from that that group of people. And then you've got the hardcore fans, but who only care about their country, right? So they always say before 1983, Indian Indian people loved cricket, and after 1983, Indian people loved Indian cricket. That's obviously a bit of a exaggeration, but you know, you have. I think a similar thing could be said of Australia, probably early on in in cricket's development, and I think we've seen that sort of thing again. Um, you know, play through with other countries as they've come through. Uh, so you have. So that's the next level, and then you have the casual sport fan uh, group. Those are the people, like, I, I, I put my dad in this, not specifically with cricket, but my dad will sort of watch whatever live sport is on. <laughs> He's got opinions on women go women's golf, but doesn't really know that much about women's golf. Sorry, Dad, if you're watching. You know, he watches his team play Aussie rules, but he watches the other teams. But again, he doesn't watch them enough to really know. He watches the, he'll watch a West Indies test match if it's in a good time zone in Australia for him to watch. But he probably doesn't know. He wouldn't be able to give you the eleven or a rough 11 of the West Indian team, right? But there will be players. Those sorts of people is actually where the money is. <laughs> Their money is not with the hardcore fans or even the hardcore team fans. The real money is with the casual sports fans, and that's what all sport in the world is geared towards. And those three kinds of fans exist. And the only other ones I would say in cricket is we have a cultural fan, which is where I'm going for more with that India-Pakistan, but you also see it a lot in the UK. You know, there'll be a cricket event in the UK and everyone will turn up in their Range Rovers with their packed lunch and everyone's got the knitted cricket sweaters. Um, and they, they almost live in this area of cricket without ever actually being uh, huge followers of cricket itself. Um, so those are the sort of four main kinds of fans that I've come across, I think, in my time. I think that's all right. Uh, uh, who have we got? Vasant says, please talk about the World Test Championship, your assessment on both teams, uh, and how India should handle New Zealand bowlers, and what would you do? I mean, that's a, that's a big question. When you ask, my assessment on both teams will be like a seven-hour essay, let's be honest. This is me we're talking about here. Um, I, I mean, I've said this a lot. I've been, I seem to have been on more other people's YouTube channels than my own of recent times. But essentially, when it comes down to it, I think that New Zealand are very, very uh, – have played a lot at home, so we don't particularly know how well they're going to go on the road. Uh, India, I think, is a better team, but New Zealand is going to play two warm-up games beforehand, and the English conditions should be very natural to them. It's not that I don't think they will favour India. It's just that I think they'll be more natural to, to New Zealand. And obviously, New Zealand did very well against India at home. But uh, – I, I couldn't give you a winner. I think we'd have to see how New Zealand handle this, the series against England a little bit and see how they're flowing a little bit more. But I think that India is the better team. But at the moment, I would have New Zealand as slight favourites, but that could completely change um, 
Uh, and I haven't delved into the matchups enough to see if there's anything specific that that, that can be have a look at. But but hopefully I will before the uh, before the series starts. Um, let me just have a look. There is a ton of questions here. Oh, sorry. So one's just come up on my screen. Um, should India invest in Varun Chakravarti and Ravi Bishnoi as Chahal and Kuldeep are not in form? Well, you can go back to my KL Raul um, video uh, to have a look at form. Um, I'm not too worried about form. I I don't think Kuldeep Yadav has been in poor form. I think that, and I've got to make a video about him eventually because I am quite obsessed. In fact, I tell you what, I'll get Brad Hogg to come on and me and Brad Hogg will talk about him at length. Um uh, because there's a lot of stuff I want to talk to Hoggy about when it comes to the left arm wrist spin. But I think there are better options than Chahal and um, and Cool Deep at the moment. I don't know about Chakravarti. I thought he bowled well at times this IPL. It'd be very, very... If you're going to pick him, this is kind of the time to pick him, I think. Uh, Ravi Bishnoi wasn't even in their side um, at the start of the tournament. I've There's a lot of moving parts with him. I think it would be a very. I think it would be a huge risk to pick both of them in your squad. I think you would want someone a little bit more. What, what would you say? A little bit more uh, dependable. Interestingly enough, it seems like Virat Kohli doesn't particularly trust finger spin. He doesn't bowl Washington Sundar, despite the fact that Washington Sundar has a fantastic record. Um, and so, because you could easily, if you're India. You're playing at home. You know roughly what the surfaces are going to be like. You've got Jadeja. You've got Sundar. You've got um, uh, Akshar Patel if you want him as well. You could easily go down that kind of route. Uh, or and a dash win as well. Um, but it doesn't seem to me that Virat Kohli particularly likes finger spin uh, when it comes to limited overs cricket. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for the question, um, Sunak. Let me just have a look here. I'll try and get past... Uh, I think I've already done that question. Okay. Oh, what? Oh, wait, I haven't done a Twitter one in a bit. Ah, oh, this one I like. I really like this question. Uh, question five from Twitter. And I'm only saying question five for the producer, Moku, because uh, it's not for you guys. Uh, I'll read it off the screen. Are BJ Watling and Chiteshwa Pajara similar kind of batters? In McCullum's 300, he acted as a rock and the other end. I have a whole video on BJ Watling coming up, right? Uh, and I... Uh, it's a, it's quite a long video. It's quite in-depth, like some of the ones that I used to be. It'll probably come out a few days before the test comes up. We're just waiting for a couple of moving parts to be uh, put in. Um, yeah, I, so I wouldn't say he's like Pajara specifically. I don't know how much you guys know about Watling, but he's basically an opening batter, and he's recreated opening the batting in the middle order, which is fascinating. I know it maybe it really is. I compared him to all the other modern middle order players that have faced a lot of balls, and he's nothing like any of the closest guy in terms of strike rate was um, Angelo Matthews. And to be fair, I think a lot of that had to do with Angelo Matthews being in poor form over the whatever the, the period was. I looked at uh, a Watley, but when it when it comes to balls per innings, uh, you know, like, Watling has a like a top order like a Jonathan Trott, a Pajara, but more so like a, an Alistair Cook type of, he's just going to face a lot of balls. Um, it's incredible. Uh, I'm, I'm massively fascinated with him as a cricketer. And I think he's um, he's really good. And, that, you know, um, thank you for asking. Feel free to ask as many Watling questions on this live as the rest of you <laughs> um, need, need to be looking at. Um, let me just go down here. There's a bunch of new uh, Larry says, is it a disaster having New Zealand making the test final? Uh, no, it's not a disaster at all. I think in some ways it makes it more interesting if it's just the big three. In fact, I'll be doing a video on this um, it's shortly. Um, but uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's an absolute opportunity for um, the ICC and the cricket world to embrace some a team outside the top three. If New Zealand win... Uh, it'd be a bit of a kick in the face for Australia, India, and England, but what a great thing it will be for cricket. Um, so no, Larry, I don't think um, I don't think it is a disaster having them make it. Uh, I can understand it won't rate as much. I can understand that for the first particular final, uh, you probably want one of your big four teams. You probably, you know, Pakistan probably being the other one in terms of audience. 
But in, in a world where the big three are, you know, getting stronger and stronger and stronger, to have your first World Test Championship and to have a country that took 39 years to win their first Test Series, uh, to have a time when we're talking about expanding cricket to allow newer teams in, absolutely brilliant to be able to say, this is what happens when you give opportunities to other teams. And these teams, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that New Zealand were talking about is giving up Test cricket maybe pushing it too much, but they they basically put all their effort into white ball cricket, what, six, seven, eight years ago? What an, you know, what a turnaround for them to make it, um, I think. So, uh, no, um, I don't believe that is the case. Um, having a look here. Could you show a preview of the Watling clip? I don't think, my producer will probably now send me a message saying no. Um, I don't think specifically uh, we have access to that um at the moment i'm trying to think if i have anything on my computer that i could even share with you uh no uh, so i think like most of us we have kind of ignored watling and there's a bunch of reasons for that if you go through it he's from new zealand and it's a small market i mean new zealand doesn't even have what i would call a major cricket writer uh, Ian Smith's probably the closest, Ian Smith and Simon Dool maybe the closest to major cricket commentators. But even then, you know, they're not they're not exactly Mark Nicholas or, you know, Ian Bishop or th- are those sorts of um, other, other sort of worldly people. So he's from New Zealand. He bats really slow, like he bats comically slow. I think he's the third slowest batter in modern cricket. He... Doesn't have a lot of shots. He's a he described himself as a limited player. So as even aesthetically, you know, there is not a you know, with you can be a slow batter and not and still be quite good aesthetically. I think aesthetically he's not particularly great to look at either. Uh he's a wicket keeper, so you know, a little bit Ringo Star type action there um on Wantley. So I think that. I tried to focus in on what had made him a successful cricketer um, and also look at how random it was that he was successful. I I don't know if you guys know, but he was not killing it in first-class cricket before he came in. And he's playing as a specialist batter and not killing. So to go from that to to be an opening batter in New Zealand domestic cricket, not doing well, get thrown into the national side, also not do well, and then come back as the wicket keeper, batting down the order, and end up with what's he got—the fourth or fifth best uh, batting average of any wicket keeper over thirty tests or whatever it is. That's incredible! Just an incredible, incredible effort there. So I hope that I hope my face just then uh, was uh, was a good trailer for the BJ Watling video. Uh, Nightwing says thoughts on SA cricket at the moment. They don't seem to be at their best since uh, the last few years. Well, I mean. It's funny how many of your questions come back to just simple. It's not like South African cricketers have suddenly became shit. Right? No one's just going, oh, we did shit. They were good. Now they're shit. Um, this is what happens when you don't have a proper environment. This is what happens when you're not paying your players correctly. This is what happens when you try and uh, you try and fix a historical wrong with a shambolic system that doesn't actually fix the problems you know the quota system will have some success and i could p- completely understand why they have done it but the problem isn't at professional cricket level the problem is that the cricketers who are coming through who are p- fully p- polished have gone to private schools and some of the, the south african private schools are one of the greatest developers of cricket talent we have ever had in any system anyway and they're going up against kids that quite often don't have that background and, of course, so you have these lopsided provincial sides and then it all goes to hell from there. Um, you know, you've got players playing in roles in the national team that they're not suited for because they have to tick a box. And it's like, you. so you have potentially good young South African players who aren't white who are having to play in roles that they're not suited for before they're ready to play international cricket. Just the, the layers and the levels of, of, of all that sort of stuff. And then you have absolutely no governance at all. Zero idiotic governance, pissing money away on a stupid um, league that they couldn't even get to be played. 
you know, fighting with the only major broadcaster in the country that could actually help them. Uh, annoying team owners who came in and spent money and were looking to develop talent in South Africa. It's It's been an absolute shit show. And it is so disappointing. They are still... The, the level of talent in South Africa has not disappeared. It's just that it has been run terribly um, and it's been run into the ground. And realistically now, I will say, I, I just, I'd be shocked if more and more South Africans don't find other ways of getting out of the country and finding new opportunities, um, no matter their race going forward, which is even the sadder situation if, if they end up even losing players, um, uh, you know, the non-white players who they were trying to develop. But... I just don't know why you would stay saying that they they literally they couldn't they could they can't operate anything at the moment. It's absolutely um it's a terrible situation for, you know, uh, a cricket nation that many of us fell in love with in the 90s when they came back. Um and it just hasn't gone the way that we would have uh we would have liked it to have gone. Uh, I'll just go to another um uh Twitter question. Uh question number 10. Uh do you think that ODI cricket till 2005 was much harder? Because some of the legends of the game average 45 in test cricket, but only 35 in ODI cricket. Um, I think it was, I don't think it was harder. I think it was fundamentally, uh, Muku, you've got two graphics up on the screen. Um, if you're listening to me, and I hope you're listening to this. <laughs> he's probably not, he's probably ha having a kip. Uh, I think, um, I don't think it's harder. I think that fundamentally the game has changed. There are more runs. Like you would expect the averages of ODI crickets to, cricket to go up because 220 used to be a good score and then we're now looking at 270 being around par for ODI cricket so that's an extra 50 runs to begin with and most of that's going to come out of, of your top order and of the top teams they're they're looking more at what 280 290 so you would expect their averages to go up them the more runs that you make the more that the average would go up I'd say that fundamentally it's a different sport than what ODI cricket used to be I think that outside of Sri Lanka's mini revolution and, you know, a couple of things that New Zealand did and the sort of Michael Bevan role, I still think that players thought about it as a normal form of cricket. And that's not, uh, you know, T20 cricket has dragged it in such a new direction that I don't think people now sit down and think of ODI cricket as a normal, as, as red, red ball cricket, but just for 50 overs. And I think it has changed. I think the, the competition has changed. Um, uh, the, the the balls make a big difference too. I think that when you when you had the one ball um, specifically for that period of time, it was actually very hard to hit out towards the end because those balls just got. I mean, the white balls are terrible. We don't talk about this enough, but they are absolutely shit house. <laughs> they are an embarrassment to professional cricket. White balls, um, and the, the you know if cricket was run by anyone, which obviously, as I keep saying, it is not. That would be one of the first things that we would fix. Uh, we haven't actually fixed that, and so you have a situation where we uh, we have this terrible ball, and then to overcome that, we then have the two white balls, which actually brings other problems uh, because part of cricket's natural uh, appeal is the degradation of the ball um but not to the point that it used to be in white cricket right ball cricket where they had to replace it at the 35 over mark anyway because it was too it was impossible to see let alone hit um so i think a lot of things have changed in odi cricket and i think that's uh, perhaps what you uh, are talking about there uh raheel says why does carry always fail once attacked around the wicket by paces because you can go and find a video on this very site everyone does it's really common for left-handers to be struggling to this for heel. Um, left-handed batters are not used to right-arm bowlers coming around the wicket to them. And in the last five years, they've all decided to come around the wicket to them and they're all struggling. They're not ready for it. It used to be in the past that you would only bowl right around the wicket if you're a specialist. Uh, Andre Nell comes to mind. I'm trying to think of someone else. Um, or if they thought you had a specific weakness against uh, left-handed, uh, uh, sorry, against around the wicket bowling. And now we're in a situation where everyone's doing it. I don't think Alex, Car I, I'd have to look at the numbers. I, I don't think Alex Carey's in the in the top handful of the worst out there. There's some um, there's some guys out there that just cannot um, handle um, right arm seam coming around the wicket to them. It's really interesting um, phenomenon. And, you know, I think a bunch of us sort of noticed it at the same time, a bunch of analysts and writers sort of noticed it at the same time, and it's getting more pronounced. Uh, the other interesting thing I found about it is it, from memory, 
and I'd have to look at this again, it's mostly a test thing. And I think it's because the white balls, you can't get that lateral movement after you know a little period of time. So it really is a test thing. But I think if I was a right arm seamer now, and I was bowling two left-handers and I had an off cutter, I'd be coming around the wicket at the death and doing what Shadul Takuo basically did uh, against England. And I think we'll see more of that as well um, because it makes sense, um, essentially. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, no, it's not a question. <laughs> Uh, someone's asked why AB to V strike rate in tests is very low. G Joe, um, is it? What's very low? Um, I'm gonna, I'm interesting to see what you mean by that. Google clicks clicks on link. Uh, he did play in innings where he made forty off about ten thousand balls once, which might have affected it. His strike rate is fifty four. That's a good solid low end attacking strike rate. I think anything over fifty. Uh, means you could score regularly. Um, it's a completely different kind of game, and he's he's playing it differently. I think AB de Villiers' main strength is his ability to play um, uh, what would be uh, the play to the situation. Um, he doesn't need to attack. I don't think that's ever been his role. Like he bats at number four, doesn't he? Maybe number five as well at times in his career. Um, he's not batting at he's he's not batting at one or two where he needs to take the initiative. Uh, he's not batting further down the order where he has a bit of a license. So I think it makes sense. I think a strike rate of 54, it'd be interesting to see how many number fours, he's a number four, isn't he? <laughs> it would be interesting to see how many number fours, new quick info stats page is quite good, isn't it? Because you can just go bang. Um, uh, uh, striking at a massively improved rate than that. Um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd have to look into that a little bit, but, as a general rule, I've got no problem with a strike rate of 54. Just have a look at his, his strike rate in first-class cricket is 56 as well. So I think he's just playing to the conditions and uh, what has been put in front of him. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, question six on Twitter. The future of finger spinners in limited overs cricket. Mystery spinners tend to survive for a period in T20s and then fall off gradually. Spinners who can't bat seem to be out of contention. Yeah, I think... The biggest difference uh, with finger spinners is really that once we started calling them for chucking or reporting them for chucking, probably the better way of putting it, uh, it completely changed their role. They went back to basically being dot ball bowlers. So I, I still think that it was actually interesting to me trying to think of the piece I wrote. Uh, sorry, it was a video I made actually on here. But I had a look and you could see that there was actually a lot of off spin still bold in T20 cricket. But when I had a look at it, it was bold by a handful of players. You know, someone like Gareth Batty bowling a lot of off spin in England and Ashwin bowling a lot in the IPL and, you know, th those sorts of players. What we've seen less of are the sort of flash in the pan finger spinners that come through and do very well for a short period of time. And we are now seeing a lot less of, I think, sort of out and out part time finger spin. Uh, which we saw before. So that's much more, that's only really bold now as a matchup, um, which is what, how it should be bold, of course. But, um, and I think once we started uh, calling, uh, reporting the bowlers for chucking, I think that took away that other thing. So you will see a lot of sort of mowing alley type bowlers in one day cricket who don't specifically get smashed a lot, but they also are not going to get you probably consistent wickets. And I think we've seen that in T20 cricket. And Washington soon does probably another good example of that off the top of my head. Um, and I think we'll probably see more and more of that coming through in uh, one-day cricket and T20 cricket. As for the future of them, <laughs> finger spin is the easiest thing to bowl if you're not very talented. It is, the, it is not particularly easy to bowl very well, but it's the easiest thing to bowl passably. And I think when you're talking about the batters, um, I think what happens is you see someone come through, I'm trying to think of someone like Anton Devsic, um, for instance. And Moen Ali is actually probably a very good uh, a version of this as well. Uh, you have someone who comes through who can bat. They can probably, if they have any sort of finger spin talent at all, you can probably kind of prop that up a little bit, give them some extra practice, and they become decent options, which means that 
you don't need a specialist spinner in that case. That's never really been the case for wrist spinners or for fast bowlers. So finger spin is the one thing that if you gave, uh, Joe Root is a really interesting one. If Joe Root wasn't the captain of England and he ended up having to be a T20 player, he would be a very, very serviceable finger spinner in T20 cricket using his brain. And he would spend a lot of time on it, a lot more time than he does now. And he, he spends a lot of time on it already, but he would spend a lot more because it would be much more profitable for him. And I think that, you know, you think of guys like Ellen Border and uh, Darren Lehman and Virunda Sewag and these sorts of guys who not real they're not Abhijan Singh or Ashwin or Nathan Lyon, are they? But they have the ability to get through overs, bowling, finger spin. And if they spend a lot of time on it, perhaps they can become someone more like uh, Anton Devsic or Moen Ali or these sorts of players. And... I think that is the evolution, really. It's dot ball guys, and it's guys who can bat and bowl a little bit, maybe spending more time on their bowling than they used to. Um, and then specialists like Gareth Batty and Ashwin and those sorts of players. That That's my guess, anyway. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Um, I always say that. I don't know why I say that. I, I mean, I have literally answered your question. I may have answered it wrong. I may have talked about something completely different. Um Makru's just sent me a message about BJ Watling, although he has written, I can show a small clip of JB Watling uh, for 30 seconds. So he was close. Um, so if Maku, if you're ready, I'm going to pause at the end of this sentence and you, my fine man, are going to show a small clip of BJ Watling. So close. So close to being professional. It does not appear like we have any sound, Maku. <laughs> Have you taken away the sound or is it just that I can't hear it? Look, you can see him panicking. I'm now live commentating my own YouTube channel fairly. <laughs> uh, our cricketers, uh, Siddharth says, our cricketers are less hardworking athletes compared to other sports. Yes. But there are reasons for that. I think partly it comes down to the fact that we professionalized very late. We haven't completely thought about off seasons properly yet. D don't forget, it's only really recently that cricketers had 20, tw 12, I almost said 24 month contracts, 12 month contracts, right? Um, up until very recently, you played for six months of the year. Uh, and then you, you probably played for six months of the year somewhere else if you were lucky. And if not, you didn't. And international cricketers, you know, a lot of them were amateur as well. I think what we haven't got is the sort of stuff that you see in basketball and baseball. Um, I don't know about football as much, but where at the end of the season, you literally, you contact your personal trainer, uh, whether it be a fitness trainer or a skills trainer, and you say, okay, you're coming to me, uh, uh, coming to my house for three months and we're going to work on this new skill. Cricketers aren't there yet. And certainly something that I've talked to a lot of cricketers about. There are cricketers who do it. There's a really good story about Jake Weatherall, the South Australian cricketer. And it's so noticeable. He basically came up with a plan. I think it was during lockdown, but it would have been off season anyway, where he said, okay, I am going to train for eight hours a day to be a better cricketer in the off season. And like, cricket.com.au wrote an article about that. And it was like, I think Barrett might have written about it for Crick Buzz as well. Eight hours a day is a normal job. That's what athletes should be doing on their, on their days off. Once they've rested their bodies and got over their injuries, they should be preparing like that. And I think that we haven't got that way in cricket. I remember Nathan Lehman saying to me that he, he would have a meeting with players that would go for like, I can't remember, maybe, maybe half an hour, an hour. And the players would feel like, well, that's my work for the day done. I came to that meeting and it's like, you know, my wife's probably on her 19th meeting um, right at the moment. Uh, and so I think that, I think that fundamentally we're not, um, we, we're not quite at that level, but it's also just because cricket has not got there. I don't blame the cricketers. We have had incredible cricketers that have worked just phenomenal amounts on that. You know, I always go back to, um, to, um, uh, to Dennis Lilly, sorry. Now there's sunlight in London, so I have to fix that. Uh, I always go back to Dennis Lilly, and 
you know, the way that he rebuilt his body and rebuilt his bowling um, skill. We have had cricketers do stuff like that, but there hasn't always been the financial gain or the system. And even, you know, having worked with T20 teams now, I, I found it really fascinating when I worked with T20 teams that on, we would, we would tr we'd play one night, we would travel the next day. And so the players who played the night before would rest, which makes perfect sense. But the players who weren't going to play weren't taken to be upskilled with the coaches. Like everyone had that day off on the travel day. You, you would get to your hotel at 2 p.m. and it's like, well, why can't we hit the nets at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock? Or why can't we do something now? And I think that cricket has just got this – it's just part of the cycle of cricket. So it almost needs to be broken by, you know, a bunch of teams, you know, a couple of international teams and probably some franchise teams and change the game. But uh, so I don't think cricketers are lazier than other athletes. I think that as a general species, we haven't worked out the best way to prepare them and to get them ready. And I think to, to be fair, I think that England and some of the um, top um, IPL franchises are maybe starting to come around to that. But we it's just there's a lot of there's a lot of things that happen in cricket that are only happen in cricket because other sports aren't the same as them and i think this is probably one of those things but there's no reason why we can't change that but that that's a really good question so thank you very much um uh question seven on twitter if maku is now recovered from the absolute embarrassment of him not being able to play that bj watling video uh Best associate national team ever. Um, uh, so who's he got in there? Ireland, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Um, yeah, I suppose Kenya would be on that list as well. I think for me it's Ireland, but that's only because, I mean, Sri Lanka basically won, in one, uh, won a game in one World Cup. Was it 79 World Cup and became a test playing nation not long after? Um, who else has he got on that list? Bangladesh won one game and... Bangladesh were nowhere near the next best team, I wouldn't have thought at that time, uh, but basically beat Scotland in an important game um, and then beat uh, Pakistan and got um, test status on the back of that. Uh, Ireland had to consistently compete to get test status, um, you know, on a completely different level um, than anyone else. The only other team I would say is Kenya. So Kenya won games in the 96 World Cup, didn't they? They won a couple of um, game one-off games in the late 90s, although that was a period of which possible money had changed hands. <laughs> um, and then did very well in the 2003 World Cup, ended up in the semifinals. Uh, I would say that they maybe had a higher peak than Ireland, but I think Ireland has been the best associate team uh, as far as beating the major teams. I think, though, Netherlands um, over a long period have been really, really strong. I wonder if Netherlands are not – oh, we're missing Afghanistan too on that, aren't we? I, I would have thought that Ireland, Afghanistan, and the Netherlands have probably been the three strongest teams not to play test cricket for a long period of time. Uh, and, you know, uh, perhaps Scotland might not be far away from that um, also coming through as well. But I, I would have thought that that is the case. I think if you look at the Netherlands team over the last three or four years, especially when they've got a full strength team, it's a ridiculously talented lineup. Um, and so, I, you know, I would certainly put them up there. But I think as far as if you're talking about upsets and things, um, I would have thought that uh, I would have thought that Ireland was the best. and. Uh, I'm going to throw one at you that is very interesting that you may not know, but Argentina. Uh, I would have thought in the 1930s that Argentina uh, were what, probably uh, one of the strongest associate teams that we've ever had. I don't think we called them associate teams at that point. Um, but I think that if Argentina had played a three-match test series against New Zealand at that point, I it would have been very, very close. Argentina drew twice with the MCC. Um it would have been very, very interesting to see Argentina go up against New Zealand, but sadly no one outside of the MCC and a handful of other teams I think ever played them. And they obviously, cricket sort of died there a little bit, although hopefully it's getting a little bit stronger again now. Um, but yeah, probably when you ask that question, you weren't thinking I was going to pop into the Argentina um, um, stuff there as well. Uh, let me just have a look if there's any other questions on YouTube coming through. Um Okay. 
Who uh, Ethan Prince says, who will be the next best test opening bowls for any country when Anderson and Broad eventually wane, and why? Well, I mean, I mean that's when you say that there's already great bowls. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if you're picking, you know, just your best eleven now. You would pick, you wouldn't pick Anderson and Broad. I mean, England don't even always pick Broad. Um, who would you go with? You probably if new ball. You probably go with. I think would you go with Boomer and Anderson maybe Cummins and Cummins first drop with Wagner behind him I would I would assume Kima Roach I'd probably have um ahead of Broad quite regularly as well um there's some good bowls around where does Rabada fit and all that he's probably another one of those first change bowlers um as well um there's some good bowlers around at the moment i don't think broad and anderson are the automatic top ones but if you're looking at who's going to dominate over the next few years yeah i mean boomer should be around for a long time uh, he might not partner with someone as consistently as anderson has partnered with broad um hazelwood still has a long time to go um uh, i think stark's a little bit older than hazelwood maybe three years older than him I'm trying to remember their ages um and so there's certainly that uh that to be factored in there uh, Bolton Southie are still around as well. There's a, God, there's a ridiculous amount of seam bowling talent in the world at the moment. That's why we put that, you know, the questions before are, are opening bats is crap now. Look at some of the bowling bowlers that people were going up against not that long ago. It has massively changed. Like all due respect to Peter Siddle. Um, but we are on a different, we are on a different level than uh, even, even guys like Andre Nell. Andre Nell would struggle to get into many of the better teams around the world at the moment. Um, and Andre Nell was a really, really good bowler. Um, you know, uh, Ben Hilfenhaus, these sorts of guys. These are not bad bowlers that I'm, that, you know, that we're, that we're coming up with at the moment. And, you know, peak Zahir Khan, is he an automatic starting member of this Indian team? Perhaps because he's left arm. And I thought Zahir Khan was an absolute genius with the ball. Um there's some good bowlers around, I think is what I'm uh, I'm saying at the moment. So um, uh, a couple of questions about the Nuggets on Twitter. Uh, I did see them lose, but let's be honest, they don't have any uh, guards at the moment. So I'm not really expecting them to be a team with a bunch of good guards in it. Uh, so if, you are, if you're coming here for NBA analysis, there's my NBA analysis. Don't go into a playoff series with uh, three of your best four guards not being fit. Um <laughs> Uh, someone said Stark's only one year older than Hazelwood. That's interesting. I thought he was a couple more years older than Hazelwood. It feels like he's been around a little bit longer. Um, I'll just see if there's anything left on Twitter. I think I got through most of the guys we wanted to go through on Twitter. Yeah, we've done that. Um, so I'll just do. I'll just take a couple of the stragglers at the end. Ram says, do you think England are wasting Ollie Robertson in the name of Anderson's longevity? I think that the chances of Ollie Robinson being a better bowler than Jimmy Anderson right now are a thousand to one. Yeah, I think that's right. I just had to work that out in my head. I mean, Jimmy Anderson's form over the last couple of years, if Ollie Robinson came in now and averaged 25 in test cricket, he would be several runs a wicket worse than Jimmy Anderson has been <laughs> over the last few years. Uh, Jimmy Anderson has been an absolute beast I can't, cannot see why England would not spend as much time as possible trying to get as many overs out of him. Um, and Ollie Robinson is, I mean, you could argue that Chris Wokes and Ollie Robinson are very good replacements for him. England are always going to find bowlers like that. Um, their bigger problem is finding, finding more bowlers like Wood and Archer um, and those sorts of guys. I don't think they're ever going to have trouble finding the more Anderson type bowler. I mean, Glenn Chappell was a phenomenal bowler and never played, you know, a test match for England. That's right, isn't it? I'm pretty sure I never played as much for England. Um, and I watched him bowl a lot in counter cricket, and he was absolutely brilliant. Um, oh, what's his name that played for Worcester as well? The, um, Richo played, you know, they're, they're never going to struggle to find those kinds of bowlers. Um, and I think that in the case of Jimmy Anderson, Jimmy Anderson is like that bowler in perfection. So in that particular case, why would you, why would you want to bring in a lesser bowler for him um, right at the moment, I think you get as much out of Anderson as you can. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of, of, of Ollie Robinson, but I'm not sure he's about to come in and average 22 in test crunch cricket over the next five years, for instance. Um, and if, if he does, 
Well, they've still got Jimmy Anderson doing roughly the same thing and they can get rid of Jimmy Anderson if he starts to not do that. So, uh, no, I don't really have a huge problem with that. Uh, uh, a lot of questions about Siraj. Oh, it's all from the one guy. Okay, I don't really have any thoughts on Siraj, if we're being honest right, right now. Um Shane Biscuit has asked, what's up with Wagner? Is his case the same as Milan? No. Wagner's incredible. That's what's up with Wagner. There's a video on this website. You can go and have a look. Absolutely deserved his wickets by doing things that no other player has ever done before, which it's not about luck. He's been bowling for a long time and been really good at it. Uh, And I will try and finish on one last question. Did Indian selectors miss a trick by not selecting Boovy for the England series? Everyone has missed the trick. Look, they've got a lot of options to them. Uh, I, I mean, un- unashamed think that um, Boovy is an absolutely overlooked bowler. Uh, I'm a big fan of him from the first time I saw him play in England. I think he's an exceptional talent. I think he's a brilliant thinker. Uh, I think he can do things with the balls that other people can't. Uh, I'd be shocked if the way that test cricket has been played in England over the last couple of years, that Boovy wouldn't be an absolute handful. But that said, India just have a ridiculous amount of seamers available to them. So uh, I can see why they're not thinking of him as first choice. But I think I think he's very, very unlucky. But uh, he's a, an exceptional talent. And, uh, you know, if if I had a cricket team, I would pick him just to play. You know, I think he'd do really well in club cricket, I think. <laughs> he's, he's fair to say. Uh, but thank you all very much uh, for coming on. Like, subscribe, share, do all those things. Uh, we haven't done a live for a little while since the IPL, but I will probably come back to doing them a bit more regularly um, going forward. Um, you know, uh, maybe during season, I might be able to get some friends on as well and we can have a good old chat about some things. But thank you so much for, for all your questions um and uh all the tweets and likes and comments uh, that you put up on youtube except for the ones that don't say nice things um you people can burn in hell uh but no but thank you very much we have we have the bj watling video coming up we've got a very interesting t20 video coming up and we have uh one of my favorite projects ever which i'm hoping will be ready around the new zealand england series um, but it's a huge, huge project, um, and we're going to have to break it up into three parts just to show it to you. Um, but uh, there is, there's a lot, there's a lot that we're working on behind the scenes, even if the channel has not looked as um, as uh, full as it, as it normally does. It's just because I've been working on some longer um, format stuff um, and some, you know, real analysis, and I basically got lost in BJ Watling's career for about four or five days there. So uh, thank you everyone for coming on, and I will talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.